It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the unrelenting Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing today, Robert? I am doing great, Andy. Happy today to talk about one of my personal favorite heroes. And when we think of the expression captain of industry, Vanderbilt comes first to mind. <clears throat> Cornelius Vanderbilt, right? Uh, yeah, yeah for, yes. for several reasons, the steam sh steamship industry and, of course, then ra the railroad mm -hmm. industry, where he excelled in both. That's right. Uh, and yes. the New York Central Railroad is, terminates in New York City at Grand Central Terminal on Vanderbilt Avenue, <laughs> right? right? And was it, was it the mm -hmm. Commodore? Cornelius was known as the Commodore. I always forget. Was it the Commodore himself or was it his son, William, who built uh, Grand Central Grand Central Terminal. The, the current I one was his son. Yes, his, okay. it was his son. Cornelius built the first one in that in that okay. spot. But his son William okay. did the current one that we get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Right, right. With with the constellations on the you know on the ceiling yes. that is you know uh, it's of it's it's of yeah. epic proportions. But we should start at the beginning, just like the 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 Commodore, yes. soon to be Commodore, did. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt That's right. Bates. There he is, seventeen ninety four to eighteen seventy seven, and he was a tough guy, right? I mean, a lot of his a lot of his That's rivals right. disliked him. They they feared him. He was he was often profane and foul mouthed. But then, could he run a business? So he could run uh, a business and. And pick a fight too, a, physically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a tough guy. He was a hard rock. Uh, yes. But uh, he he was born uh, in, in a part of New York where you spent much of your childhood, right on that's, on Staten Island. That's that is true, Andy. I, I could say one of the reasons I'm a personal favorite of mine. From age ten to eighteen, I lived in Staten Island on Vanderbilt Avenue, and I remember as oh, really? a kid, okay. I was like, who. What, yeah, what is the street named after? And I, I go into the encyclopedia and I read about Vanderbilt. And of course, like you at that era, I'm a total hero worshiper and I fall in love with his story, except for this expression, robber baron. I'm thinking, what's yeah, that? Yeah. You know, who did he rob from when he created all of this, all of these products and services uh, that, that influenced, especially New York City? Uh, so uh, yeah, born in Port Richmond, to a huge uh, Dutch family. He was like one of, I think, eight uh, children. And they were farmers dating back a couple of centuries. Uh, we know that New York was originally New Amsterdam as far as the Europeans go. And Staten Island had a huge uh, farming community. And yeah, Vanderbilt grew up on a farm, but quickly he started to assert his own, he, he loved the water, he loved swimming. He was, he was really strong. And his parents wanted him to be a farmer. They wanted him to like continue continue that role. But because he saw ships regularly and he could spot the difference between this kind of ship and another. Uh, so between swimming and, and looking out at the water, that was where his future was. Right, right, yeah, yeah. He was a, he was a mariner. Without a doubt. And you know, a, a lot of people uh, may not be familiar with New York City geography. And Staten Island is like the lesser known, you know, of the five boroughs yes. or the, 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 f the five counties. But in fact, we used to joke as kids in Brooklyn that the Verrazano Bridge was what kept Staten Island afloat. You know, otherwise it would sink. It would sink into. into That's a good one. <laughs> otherwise, it would sink into New York Bay. But yes, Staten, Staten Island is uh, well, like the well, well, all of New York City except for the Bronx are islands, right? Manhattan Island, your islands, Brooklyn, yep. Brooklyn, Staten Brooklyn Island, and, Queens, and Long, Island, Long Island, Island, and Manhattan Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and Staten Island, the Bronx is the only borough or county of New York City that's attached to the North American mainland and so it's not an accident that new york is is what is one of the great port cities in the in in the world um yes. so yeah but it's down to this day i haven't been there in years but the last time i was there it was still more rural than you know than the rest of, still is. of new york city yeah it might still be parts some of it are built up 
you're right. Yeah, there parts of it are built up, up, but it is. Yeah, there still are some farms, def definitely. Yeah. And there's also a diff somewhat different mindset, uh, Andy, within Staten Island. In fact, they've considered seceding from from the rest of <laughs> but what the well what the Blasio I, was may is certainly who could who you know who could each, right but even before de Blasio you know I remember when I was a kid when Ford when Ford lost to Jimmy Carter I asked my mother why and she said Staten Island uh, he, he Staten Island was the only borough that uh Ford won and she said private owners private homes uh which is what Staten Island had more of so they tilted tilted uh more to the right uh, politically, but uh, but yeah, so Staten Island, he put it, he is the most famous Staten Islander for sure. And so he started uh, ferrying, his father had a ferry. Well, no, well let me ask you a question, Robert. He, yeah, if I, he, if, uh, he, he didn't have a lot of formal schooling. Is that is that correct? I, I, I no, vaguely you're right. He stopped, like many people back then, they had to work. The, the yeah, school sure. was an afterthought and he was part of a right. big family and he needed to be a breadwinner at like 10, 11 years old because he had many younger siblings. So he never really learned. Uh, he knew rudimentary numbers, which certainly helped him in business, but he had his own code of writing. Like he would spell things the way he thought they sounded and never developed that <laughs> that intellectual bend. That was, that was not what he was all about, but a keen business sense. You know, from oh, an yeah, early obviously. age, that highly, mm -hmm. highly intelligent. You know, certainly in his, yes. certainly in his field, and yeah. so I'm sorry, and so, ambitious. So, so you, was... yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and ambitious, and even so, he starts. Uh, his father has this ferrying business, and Vanderbilt, when he's 10, 11, 12, he starts to get involved with it, and then by the time he's sixteen, he wants his own business. Okay, he, he, he's like, I, I want to start my own business. And he asked to borrow 100 bucks from his mom. And he had a great relationship, by the way, with his mother. He absolutely loved her. It, he had a bit of a competitive relationship with his father, which we'll talk about. But the mother said, we, you have to ask your father. Because at that t in that era, t until 21, you were kind of obliged to be with your family and, and somewhat do what they wanted. And Vanderbilt goes to his father and the father says, yeah, okay, I'll give you a hundred bucks. If you can clear out this new farm area, which is all rocks and dirt within a certain period of time, I think like one month and Vanderbilt gets some friends together, kind of like uh, Tom Sawyer. And he offers right. them, Hey, right. I'm going to buy, <laughs> I'm going to buy my own ship and you can go to Manhattan. You can do this. You can do that. You can be part of my business. If you help me set up this, uh, this farm area. And they did it and his father loaned them the money and then that was his you know again this is 15 16 years old he's already envisioning what an organization is like he has this long-range plan he's offering value in exchange for for effort and i think after in a year's time he he starts ferrying from manhattan to staten island and in a year's time he makes enough of a profit to pay his father 100 bucks plus a thousand dollars. So wow, imagine wow. what the family is wow. thinking, you know, <laughs> somebody yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, industrious uh, in their family. Is a breadwinner, like you said. Yeah. Let's, let's, let, let, let's set the context for just a minute. Sure. 1794, you know, so, so you, America is a very, is a, there's an independent republic by this time, but a very young nation. The immortal George Washington is president of the United States. Is, yeah, you know when yep. uh, when when Vanderbilt is born. So I mean, even think about that. So so he's growing up. Washington's president, then Adams, then Jefferson. He's sixteen, mm -hmm. so I'll be eighteen, ten. What James uh, uh, Jefferson is no longer president. James Madison's president, I think, by then. Uh, so he's this is a, this is a real golden age of of uh, you know America's youth and very. Uh, independent, you know, it's a pioneer spirit, very independent, and we'll see in a, in a few minutes. I think Vanderbilt's hatred of monopolies and his yes. uh, lifetime war against against legal legal you know legal monopolies and and, and monopolists. So this is an mm -hmm. era, you know, this is the the great era of of American history, the freest periods. Hopefully, we could 
you know, reconstruct that in the future. But but as of right now, this is the freest yeah. period in American history. And Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt's of that spirit of an independent He's man. Of that and yes. yeah, mm -hmm. fighting against the monopoly, the Fulton monopoly. We should say something about Fulton because he was a you know a, a mixed case. But on his ferry, mm -hmm. you know, Vanderbilt had that sign, New Jersey must be free. New Jersey you, must you be free, I mean? yeah. It's like one, one of the great moments in the history of capitalism. New Jersey must be free. Yeah. I, I, but I'm sorry, sir. We, no, 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 Andy, that's coming up very shortly. So let's just talk about yeah. the 1812 war. Vanderbilt becomes involved. He helps in some of the transport because the English were blockading the, the Atlantic coast for these big ships. And because Vanderbilt had a smaller ship, he was able to, to take part and help America in the war of 1812. I mean, that's not, that's, we'll see, he has a much bigger impact in the Civil War decades later. But already yeah. he's establishing himself with a, name, with a name for himself. And then after the 1812 war, uh, he meets up with Thomas Gibbons, who is uh, a very successful um, shipper has his own business uh, ferrying new york to new jersey and he employs for the only time in his life uh, vanderbilt chooses to work for someone not full-time uh, because he had so many of his other business ventures but this is critical in vanderbilt's life because he sees someone who's ahead of him uh business-wise and it puts him in new york city more often where staten island is mostly farms and by the way when you, you know you talk about the time time era 90 more than 90 percent probably like 95 percent of industry was in farming at that time mm -hmm. and so if sure. we look at the gradual um transition to what i call the hamiltonian era of industrialism and commerce and finance i think i think vanderbilt is the archetypical and, uh, example and urban, of this. And, urban and, and urbanization that's right and urbanization right. making new york city the financial capital uh, of the world right. uh, of, of the country at least but yeah so you, during this during this job for gibbons going back and forth in new york new jersey the fultons and livingston uh they have a monopoly on that and they don't want new jersey competition coming into new york and that's where your point why don't you tell them uh, i'm sure you cover this yeah, by well, the way in your capitalist yeah. manifesto uh book but yeah go ahead yeah. Well, first, we should give some props to Robert Fulton, who was the American yes. inventor of the steamboat. Inventor. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't remember if they had been, if any of the British had invented a steamboat first. It's, 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 it's possible. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But in, in America, Fulton invented the steamboat. And, you know, when they used to, you remember, when they used to teach some history in the American schools and in, in fourth grade, they would teach yes. New York City history. And they, they tell us, you know, teach us about uh, uh, Fulton Steamboat, the Claremont steaming up the Hudson from New York City to Albany at, at a very sedate four miles an hour. <laughs> but, you know, yes. so, you know, Fulton, Fulton was an innovator. He was, a, you know, he was, an, he was an inventor. So he gets a lot of, you know, props uh, for that. But... He was also a you know a political monopolist, and uh, he wanted mm -hmm. you know if you uh, if you invent something, you know I think it's right and proper that you have a patent, and for X number of years you're the only one who can manufacture and sell it before it becomes in the public domain. But that doesn't mean that you get to be the only guy who could use it, <laughs> you, you, you know. Yes. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know and, and so uh, other people should have the you know in a free country have the right to buy the steamboats from the Fulton company and then set up, set up their company, you know, you know ferry service uh, or, or whatever. But he had a monopoly on the, on the ferry service, not just to manufacture steamboats, but to, but to use them commercially. And so you're right, Gibbon fought against the monopoly, hired Vanderbilt who hated, who hated the, the, the monopoly and, and Vanderbilt ferry passages back and forth from New Jersey to, to New York City with that great sign on his ferry of New Jersey must be free. And you know, law enforcement was after him. He eluded them for I don't I don't know, a period of months. It was, this, yes. this is like, you can just this, what a great movie. This is, this is so visual, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know Vanderbilt playing cat and mouse with the uh, you know with the authorities and elu eluding them. Secret compartments in his in his ships so that he could hide when they come on board. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and, of and course, a letter in his prices. pocket, right? 
Yeah. And he has a yeah, letter think, in his I pocket think... from Tompkins, right? The, the vice president saying if he gets captured, yeah. he has like a get out of jail free card <laughs> because the, the Tompkins uh, has this letter saying that he's, a, he's allowed to uh, make this transportation route for this day. So uh, just incredible cat and mouse. You're, you're right. I mean, yeah. outmaneuvering. Yeah, it's exciting. But, uh, can Great I say one thing? Great, great movie. Right. You're right. Totally. Totally. But anti monopolist is one thing. But if we go with Ayn Rand, she says it's not enough to be against. It's 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 more important to be for something. And there's a reason we call him the first capitalist, self made capitalist, because he was pro free markets. The term capitalism didn't exist back then. But we'll see through the course of today's show how he was against monopolies, but in favor of free competition, free trade, free markets, his entire life. That was, uh, yeah, that was absolutely a, an essential part of uh, Vanderbilt's uh, character. Yeah, absolutely. And we, a couple of things. He was known in his day as the greatest anti-monopolist in the, in the country, but you're right. That's a, that's terming it in, in the, you know, as a negation. The, the positive, is, which is much more important, is that he was pro free free trade. He, he was pro free yes. free market. And 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 the key economic factor about this, of course, is that Vanderbilt his entire career slashed prices to the bone. You know, the, the when you have a yes. monopoly, you could you know, you could charge you know, a legal monopoly, and nobody could enter a field against you. You could charge higher prices, uh, mm -hmm. but. Once you have competition, of course, you know, the, 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 the competition for, for customers brings the price down. And Vanderbilt did that over and over again in his career. Yeah. He lowered prices uh, from, what, uh, for, from what any of his competitors were charging, and certainly what any monopol monopolist competitors were charging. And of course, that enormously benefits the customers. And uh, yeah, one you know, example, funny, Landy, uh, just. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, just give him one concrete. I think New York to Albany was like $30 at first when he was competing, and then he reduced it to 10 then to 3 and then eventually did it for free. That's Imagine right. that. Making, made money. Ha having this he service for free, and he only made for it on food and beverages. Yeah, he made money. And, and yeah, so he, made, he made money by selling refreshments, right? right. So, yeah, yeah, a free service. $30 back then was a lot of money. You know, yeah. and the, you know, yeah. pre, that was the pre-industrial era. It's post-Civil War. The United States becomes an industrialized power, and uh, you know, agricultural societies are always poorer than industrialized mm -hmm. ones. So that, that was that was a lot of money. So the, to lower the to, to eliminate the price, bring it to zero, and then make money by you know by on concessions. <laughs> wow, I mean, and he was still able to make money. He was so cost efficient that he was still able to make money. Uh, in that way, and that's a, a a hallmark of the great American capitalists, and we've done some of them on the Hero Show. We did Carnegie, we did Rockefeller, now Vanderbilt. Yes, all of them were sticklers for efficiency because that enables us to lower costs, which of course enables us to make a profit selling at a lower price. And so, yeah. you know, Vanderbilt, you know, Vanderbilt benefited the customers enormously, which is why I want to want to mention that some of that from Atlas Shrugged here for just a minute. Uh, Robert, mm -hmm. because, you know, readers of Atlas Shrugged might remember Dagny, you know, really, in Dagny Taggart, who runs the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, you know, really admires her ancestor, Nat Taggart, who built the Transcontinental Railroad. Tough guy, 19th century entrepreneur, yeah. you know, he said the mm -hmm. one, the one mm -hmm. rival that he uh, was jealous of was the guy who said, the public be damned. And uh, that was that was the Commodore's son. That was uh, in real life. That was William Vanderbilt who, who said William that. William Vanderbilt. Yeah. We need to be clear. Yeah. yeah we need to be clear for a, a, a fictional uh, business heroes like Nat Taggart or Dagny Taggart, real life business heroes like Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt or his son William Vanderbilt. When they say the public be damned, what that means, of course, is. We, this, we work for the stockholders uh, you know, in the company. The shareholders have invested money in this company. It's our fiduciary responsibility. Indeed, it's our moral responsibility to do the best we can to make money for our shareholders. We don't work for the public. We work for, you know, we work for the stockholders in the company. Now, how do we make money for the stockholders? By giving the public 
really good products or services that we have to be clear on the, you know, on the, on the full meaning, but we don't work for the public. They don't dictate policy on our railroad. You know, that's right. We, 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 we dictate the policy and we know, you know, uh, then the customers, then like Hank Brennan says in his trial, the customers get to decide whether they like the product or service or not. If they don't like it, they, you know, then they're, they're not in a free, free society, a free market. They're not obligated to patronize our company. They can go elsewhere. But that's what William Vanderbilt meant. You know, that's not, it's not that the, the way the yeah. leftist historians construe it is that we're going to rip off the public and we're going get, to get, 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 get a lot of money, you know, illegally or immorally, and we're going to by, by harming the public. That's not, that's not the meaning of it. That's not how any good businessman makes money on an open market. And uh, the Vanderbilt family knew that. Yeah. And Andy, one, one book actually, which I'm sure, I'm sure you've read uh, Burton Folsom's uh, Entrepreneurs yeah. versus the State. Uh, here he uses the term, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of um, the economic entrepreneur versus political entrepreneur. I, 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 but this is what Vanderbilt faced. I mean, today it's a crony. He faced these cronies, yeah. which sadly Fulton was, and then uh, Drew was. Throughout his whole life, he had he was at a disadvantage against competitors who had political pull. And um, but just going back to the to the time frame, so he's working for Gibbons, and they have this landmark decision um, uh, that Daniel Webster uh, votes in favor of um, overturning the monopoly. The the uh, well, that was the Gibbon versus the Ogden. Gibbon, Gibbon That's right, Gibbon versus Ogden. Versus Ogden. Case. Exactly, yeah. So now uh, Vanderbilt is more free to compete, as is Gibbons, but Gibbons doesn't last that much longer. And at one point, here's this wealthy, very successful businessman. He sees the rise of Vanderbilt and he says, I, I fear this man. <laughs> okay, he sees that Vanderbilt is just has this incredible drive. Uh, efficiency, as you said, cost-cutting, innovation as well. And something that we never hear about and we never see in movies when we, they depict capitalists, he pours all his money, not into mansions, but in back into the business so that he can create more products and create more value that, um, that can in turn increase his wealth. So Gibbons dies and Vanderbilt has a choice. Do I want to work with his son now or do I just cut ties and then uh, start on, on my own. And his son was not a fraction of, uh, didn't, have the, didn't have the capacity that his father did. So Vanderbilt gives up on the whole uh, Gibbons uh, relationship and then just goes on his own and gradually, you know, succeeds go, just going up the ladder into, into the 1830s. Uh, which is when he gets the term, the expression Commodore, which was only for Navy men at the time. It was only granted right, to right. Navy men, but his reputation is now rising as this efficient, reliable, uh, in, in, uh, industrious businessman. And he is just uh, completely on the ascent. Uh, and he's a, he's a man of the times in the sense of what you said as well. There's a high degree of freedom that America has, if you take out the, you know, the periodic uh, cronyism and monopolies. And also he starts to envision the idea of a corporation, which did not exist re really. I mean, one, one of the, um, one of the really important points in, in, um, there's a book by TJ Styles called The First Tycoon, and he gets this point about Vanderbilt that he can see what we consider the unseen, the, 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 the benefit of a corporation. And we saw how when he was 10 years old, he's already hiring, like de uh, delegating responsibility to younger people. Now his business is rising and he's, he's gaining more esteem and um, more routes, bring, bringing more value to the public as a result. Yeah, and, and in the decades before the Civil War, you're right. I mean, he's expanding uh, not only in the United States, and he's, he's uh, you know, uh, steamboat, steamboat service from New York to New England and, you know, and, and, to, and mm -hmm. New York to Philadelphia. He starts to expand, you know, internationally. When I mean, he's running the steamboats uh, to California, well, that's, that's still, you know, the North American concept. But that's coming next, Andy. Through. That's the 1840s. Yeah, okay, if, we, yeah. if we want to talk about yeah. the gold rush. Yeah, that's next. Yeah, the that's gold the rush. Point. And also, um, 
and also the you know transatlantic. He's uh, you know, he's running uh, he's running steamships across across the pond to, to England. He builds his first ship, okay, uh, the North Star, and does a tour of Europe. And Europeans are astounded. Okay, this is the 1840s. They can't believe it. this is a private individual who's built this ship, they're like dumbfounded, but he wanted to show Europe what is possible with individual initiative. You know, if nothing else, if Vanderbilt had an ego. He had an ego again in the proper oh, sense. Yeah. He knew what he was capable of and he wanted to show that. He was not this, he was not Andrew Carnegie. I mean, here's where like one reason I say personal favorite, Carnegie and Rockefeller especially were way more about giving away. I don't know if it was guilt induced or what. They were more about giving away wealth. Vanderbilt was about, no, I'm earning this, I'm working for this and I have an ego and I'm proud. So this vessel that I just built is, we're gonna show Europeans what, <laughs> what Americans are capable of doing. So yeah, that's your transatlantic. No, no, yeah, no, I, I and I get your point, Robert. But also want to point out a lot of the philanthropy that Carnegie and Rockefeller did went to went to really good causes, you know, to schools and you know libraries. Yes, initially, and yeah, and, and Vanderbilt yes. too. We'll get to oh. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you know, Vanderbilt University. Yeah, right in, in the was right. that Nashville, right? Yep. Um, that's right in Tennessee. <laughs> But 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 yeah, I get you. I get your point. Uh, yeah, Vanderbilt had an ego. Didn't he want to put his picture on like the dollar bill or something? Or something? I forget. It was it was it was, it was, a, it was a, some unit of of U.S. currency. He wanted his own yes. picture on it. So yeah, nah, George. Washington the only person he looked up to. Yeah, it was him. It was George Washington and Vanderbilt. Like that was it. So he goes to Europe, and there are all these great works of art, and they're wondering, are you going to buy these? He comes back with one work of art. It's a bust of himself. He gets like one of the best <laughs> artists in Europe, and it's a bust of himself. This is what I mean by the, by the ego in, yeah, in, yeah, a, no. in a good uh, sense. Yeah, I know, I get, right? I get he's not, he's not J.P. Morgan. He's not this great connoisseur <laughs> of you know of, no, he's of not. artworks, but but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The, yeah, he had a gigantic ego, and uh, and he was a tough guy, and they they said you know he. He, what, 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 when he became a real successful, well, you know, there's, there's a, there's an expression, so and so, so and so swears like a sailor, you know, and that yeah. was, that was Vanderbilt. He was, he was profane and he could, he could, you know, get very angry and go on and go on a tirade. There's, there's these legendary mm -hmm. stories. Uh, I don't know whether they're true or apocryphal of him in negotiations with John D. Rockefeller, uh, you know, at Standard yeah. Oil. He died in 1877. So, you know, Rockefeller was just coming into his own then. But uh, so I don't yes. know if the stories are apocryphal, but Rockefeller was a devout Baptist, never cursed. <laughs> you see what a great business meeting with Vanderbilt because Rockefeller expected rebates, you know, because uh, he was yes. ship, shipping mm -hmm. him large mm -hmm. amounts of oil. Vanderbilt didn't want, you know, didn't want to you know, give him that, you know, cut cut rate price uh, for, for shipping. And from what, I, from what I've read, Vanderbilt would yell and cuss and bang the table. And, Rockefeller is very calm and you know and and uh, you know not self self possessed and never cursed, soft spoken. But you know, but, but adamant in his demands for rebate. Now, I don't know if that story is true or not. It certainly could be given their characters. But like I said, Vanderbilt died eighteen seventy seven. Rockefeller was just coming into his own at that time. I saw, just so coming I into know. his but own. If, if yeah, it, he learned Rockefeller, if, if, they benefited. If, if it is true, right. wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall for such a business meeting between these two titans of such very different personalities? That, that would have been fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, eighteen forties, America has the gold rush in San Francisco. How do people go out there uh, to San Francisco? It's really, really risky to go across land through the Rockies, passing the natives. The odds of making it from the center or even the East Coast to California, it's not not very high. So yeah, Vanderbilt the, comes up with this Santa route. Fe, the Santa Fe Trail, Santa Fe Trail or yeah, whatever. Yeah, go, right. yeah. It, it was it was risky given the terrain, the weather, bandits, Absolutely. and of mm -hmm. course, uh uh, marauding. There's no good locution. American Indians. I don't like the term Native Americans because it's politically yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. It makes it sound yeah. like these tribes were indigenous to the North American continent, which they most certainly were not. We've known for a long time that they they were yeah. you know, Central Asian or you know or Siberian in origin. Uh, American Indians inaccurate because they're not from India, but at least got the right continent. It's Asia. 
But anyway, be that as it may, some of these tribes were hostile and uh, very dangerous. So yeah, you're right, Robert. The tr the, the transcontinental trek uh, to get to California to be a, to be a 49er in 18 late 1840s yeah. or 1850 was was very dangerous, very dangerous. And there's no. So what does Vanderbilt do? Yet. He he takes his ships and he sees in Nicaragua, which is 500 miles closer than Panama. He's, he does this trip himself and he passes alligators and the jungle. I mean, here's where the guy practiced what he preached. You know, like he's like, well, let me go down there and see what it's like before I build my line. And so he takes his ship down to Nicaragua and then between a couple of lakes from the Atlantic to the Pacific, they, they uh, create some canals and short railroads that bridge the two. And Vanderbilt establishes a service to have... Uh, people transport from, uh, I think in 25 days, uh, they would go from, say, New York to San Francisco. Uh, ridiculously safe by comparison. And by the way, we, we didn't even talk about the risk uh, that he endured, as, 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 even as uh, in his younger days, of steamboat explosions, of, uh, you know, this this was not a given. There, there was a lot of yeah. risk and, and even... In innovations come along with risk. And Vanderbilt almost died. I think it was like 1833. He had like a punctured uh, lung in, in some kind some kind of accident. And his doctor saved his life and he became his only doctor the rest of his life. And he realized that, you know, if I died at this age, I would not really have left a mark on myself. So safety was a me, another, you know, we talk about cutting costs, Andy, and, and efficiency, but safety was also another aspect for Vanderbilt to take care of. So he, he establishes this route through Nicaragua to San Francisco. And in the process, where does that gold from California go? To, uh, back to New York banks, which is an essential part of New York becoming the financial capital of America. So he's transporting people one way to San Francisco and then gold the other way to New York just incredibly uh, beneficial to the country. Right, right. And uh, this is this was decades before the Panama Canal, right? Which is- Panama early, Canal, yeah, early, absolutely. Early, mm -hmm. Yeah, early 20th century. So they had a, yeah. they had a uh, what, use railroad to, use railroad to get across uh, parts of Nicaragua to get to the, to the Pacific, yes. you know, or, get, or coming from the- And Pacific deal with the unstable the government. You know, there is always, there was always corruption that, that uh, you know, in the in those Latin American countries. I mean, that sadly has, has not really gone away. But no, Vanderbilt true. found ways to make it profitable, to make it profitable for people to pay, you know, out of their own pocket for this incredible risk. And so the gold rush, he gets, he gets incredible credit for making that what it, you know, what it amounted to. Yeah, speaking of you know uh, political instability, there was this uh, great, uh, it's an amazing story. This uh, American adventurer named William Walker, who uh, overthrows yes. the Nicaraguan regime and sets himself up as you know the as the dictator in, in there, and he eventually get, gets overthrown, has to be smuggled out of the country by the by a uh, United States Navy officer. But I mean, you know, it's, yeah. and Walker, Walker and Vanderbilt. I don't think, if I remember correctly, I don't think they hit it off very well. I think that you know. Right. No. Walker, Walker, no. Walker issued laws when he was dictator against Vanderbilt's against Vanderbilt's policies. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. Vanderbilt dealt with a lot of opposition, and uh, as we get closer, as we get closer to the Civil War, Vanderbilt built an ironclad, you know, gigantic yes. steamship, right? Gigantic by the standards of the day, which of course he had named. The Vanderbilt. <laughs> what, the what, Vanderbilt. Else? <laughs> what else? What else? What else? Right? <laughs> yeah. What else would he? Do? Would he, David? Now, did, uh, did he use the Vanderbilt for transoceanic, for transatlantic uh, uh, transport? I think or? initially he did. Yeah, but then he saw he the need, and he saw the need in the Civil War. Met with Lincoln. Met with Grant. He really got along with Grant because Grant was a horse. Uh, 
horseback rider, and so was Vanderbilt, uh, and he would take him around when when Grant came yeah, to and New Grant, York. Grant was a ha- Grant was a hard drinking kind of dude that you can see Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt and Grant in yeah. that you know in their cups, you know, getting you know, really <laughs> you're forming forging a bond. You can, you can see that between two guys like that. And Grant and didn't Grant, like all the, the pop and circumstance. Here. On top of that, he didn't like the 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 celebrity status. He like he would rather be riding his horse, having fun with with a man like Vanderbilt, yeah. than being yeah. honored these, at these some were celebration. Two, mm-hmm. Right, these were two manly men, you know, man man's men. Yeah, you can yeah. see them. You, you can see them yeah. getting along. And um, yeah, Grant, we haven't done a hero show episode yet on Grant. And we we have to coming and soon. When yes, we do coming that, soon. yeah, coming soon, right? And when we do that, we will we will seek a, an answer to the timeless question of who is buried in Grant's tomb. Who's buried right? in Grant's tomb? <laughs> who's, who, yes. who, who is in, who's in Grant's tomb? <laughs> Anyhow, hint: Sherman's in there too. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's okay. In the uh, uh, Upper West Side of New York City, that's, right? Um, that's right? Yeah, where Howard Roth built the started temple. <laughs> no, no, in that area, hundred thirteenth and area. Riverside Drive, something like that. Yeah, yeah there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you go. So, and, 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 Civil War, Civil War. Yeah, well, Vanderbilt wants, helps. Vanderbilt wants to use the iron-clad Vanderbilt to, to help defeat the Confederacy, right? Yeah, and does, and, and, and the, absolutely yeah. does. We've talked enough about the then, war, but after the, yeah, go ahead. Well, let's make one point about the war, Robert, uh, because yeah. there's that famous confrontation in the Civil War, the, the Merrimack and the Monitor, you know, the, the, Monitor, yeah. the, the Confederacy's mm-hmm. ironclad warship against the Union, you know, the Merrimack against the Union's ironclad warship, the, uh, the Monitor. And uh, Vanderbilt offered his services to the to the United States Navy, the United States government, you know, to, that, that the Vanderbilt could see was was that was now converted into a warship, uh, will sink the Merrimack. When he, and what does he tell the U.S. government? He says, he says I'll hunt, uh, it's something like, I'll hunt the critter, just stay out, stay the hell out of my way or something. He tells yeah. them, you know. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Never got, I could do it myself, he never basically. Got, he never got the, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He never got the chance, unfortunately. But you can see, you can see, you know, especially given the size of the Vanderbilt, no other, no other method worked. He could ram, you know, he could have rammed, Yes. Uh, the Merrimack. But but anyhow, yeah, this is the kind of tough guy Vanderbilt is. And not surprisingly, he's, you know, not, not just he was a northerner, but, you know, I, I assume, I, I don't remember this, uh, that Vanderbilt was probably an abolitionist, uh, probably was opposed to slavery because he was, well, yeah, I, actually, I don't, not, I don't remember for sure. I don't remember. Right. Sure. I don't know specifically that, but he did have, there were two, there were two things um, first of all, Gibbons was a Southerner, came up from the South and had a lot of his racist uh, aspects in, in his personality, mm-hmm. which which Vanderbilt did not agree with. He certainly did not agree with. He did, um, his second wife, we didn't talk his mar- about his marriage and his offspring, but his second wife was from the South. And uh, the important thing to me is that after the Civil War, after the North won, it was, it's not like everyone shaked hands and now now we're all, you know, kumbaya. No, there was still hostility oh, yeah, no. between the two. And there was, I think, a minister in Nashville who, uh, who Vanderbilt liked and he wanted to give money. He, he, this was like an act of philanthropy, but not for a church, not for any kind of religious uh, or, um uh, institution. So the minister said, okay, we'll build this university. And it had a, it had a generic name, but eventually, yeah, they did call it Vanderbilt University. And <clears throat> Elliot, if you could put up the, there's one, the, the statue, when I went to Nashville, I've been there a couple of times, but I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to get, I want to get a, a picture of this. So you could actually even see it from the street, right? As the entrance into this beautiful campus, I think they're the volunteers, right? Is no the Commodores actually? Yeah, the Commodores is the yeah, yeah, uh, the, the, yeah. The, after... Their sports teams are the Commodores. Yeah, the volunteers are the the, the Commodores. Yeah, yeah. Right, confusing the C team, right. but uh, but yeah. So here's the statue, and this is Vanderbilt's act of generosity, healing. So we always think of this hard, you know, 
brass knuckles kind of guy, but he had humanity in him as well. And he loved America and wanted America to be united. And here was one of the actions that he took uh, to that end was to yeah well that shows uh, yeah donate that for, shows a, you mm-hmm. know a good deal of you know, a lot of goodwill but i'm surprised he didn't insist that the university be named vanderbilt university you know, as a as a precondition <laughs> right. you know given, given the you know given the money you know <laughs> yeah. and, the, and that the sports teams yeah the mascots good... and the sports teams have to be the commodores you know but anyway right. yeah i take back what I said about Vanderbilt being an abolitionist, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I, I don't, I don't know. But uh, give yeah, his, he was more about business. Aunt- you know, he was certainly more about business. I don't, I don't think he. I don't, I don't know much evidence either way, Andy. I've read a lot of. Yeah, him, I know. I'm just. Know yeah, I'm extra. I'm extrapolating here, given his free market, free society, yeah. individualistic principles. It would well, what would be most consistent with that is you know well if you know. Black Americans could could do could do the work. I, I'm going to hire them. You know, they if they some guy black yeah. guy wants to start a business and he's very efficient at what he does. You know, I'm going to purchase his product. You know, and and so on and so forth. And, uh, it's mm-hmm. but anyway, people aren't mm-hmm. always people are not always consistent. That you know, that anti racist, anti slavery mentality is most consistent with his individualism. But people aren't always consistent. So I so I take that back. Anyhow, yeah. so I don't know. I, I don't know. But uh, so. After the Civil War, of course, this is the great era of railroading. You know, That's right. well, actually, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, so, so some of the, the the transcontinental lines are not, you know, initially not so great. Right? They're right; they're built with government subsidies and the government, and yeah, inefficient. Credit Mobile, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. And, and you know, and the transcontinental lines, the Union Pacific, you know, for for example, they got money for miles of track lay, so it did it didn't matter to them if they yeah. were building efficiently you know if they were avoiding you know uh, steep steep grades and you know heavy you know, heavy heavy curvature uh you know mm-hmm. there's just just mm-hmm. miles miles of track lanes they got they got money and and the, those railroads were a wreck when it, you know we did we did edward h harriman on the hero show and he took over the yeah. when, he, when he purchased the union pacific in the 1890s it was it was what, yeah. what did they call it, a rusted streak of iron he's the one who turned it into a great railroad to rival james j hill's yes. great northern but on on yes. the east coast or, or further east vanderbilt was building private right vanderbilt wasn't building with government subsidies and the new york central railroad yeah became you know and, and of course grand central terminal in new york city uh became a very very productive railroad didn't it yeah absolutely and if we talk about the the arc of <clears throat> oh you can go to to the new york uh, the other statue in in front of grand central so the arc of the railroad industry you could say vanderbilt was a little bit late to the game but because he didn't think it could pay for itself so between the government subsidies and the fact that it couldn't really justify, uh, there were a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of bad lines, and and he first started taking over, buying up these ones that were not profitable, and he figured a way to make them profitable. But like you said, New York Central, the, the Harlem line, and yeah, he mm-hmm. he puts them all into one spot, uh, cuts up New, New York's Fourth Avenue, which would be renamed Park Avenue and builds this terminal, this one terminus where all of these trains would come in, now branches to all the other parts of the Midwest and up north and the south. Again, he's uniting the country with, you know, the way Ayn Rand describes it in, in At the Shrug, like the, these arteries, how the railroads connect all these different industries and, and they serve as these lifeblood for for from from earlier in, in the century with the textiles in New England, so he's helping different industries. We mentioned Rockefeller with with uh, oil and Carnegie with steel. Vanderbilt is the central point here. Uh, railroads at age seventy, the guy was already the richest man in the country. He no one ever knew right. how much he right. he made, but seventy years old, you're way past life expectancy. Uh, uh, at that age, yep, and he gives it yep. all up. He gives up all shipping. Uh, Ayn Rand, the money-making personality, one of my favorite essays of hers. She mentions this about Vanderbilt that he had a long-range vision. 
even at age 70, that he saw the future and invested in it. You know, uh, again, if we talk about today's name of Vanderbilt is with mansions, and we mentioned his son William and his offspring, but not Cornelius himself. I mean, he had he had a respectable place in in New York, but he was never ostentatious the way that some the you know some of the other um, competitors became. So yeah, that's yeah certainly yeah. a crowning achievement here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. You're right, Robert, uh, because he was he was worth like a hundred million dollars, so something like that. Which when he died, the purchasing yeah. power of a hundred million dollars in 1870, 18, late 1860s, would be very, way more than what $100 million is today. The $100 million today is still very, very wealthy. But $100 million in 1868 or 1870, you were, billion, you were a multi-billionaire in, in terms of your purchasing yeah. power, you know, and by today's monetary state. 70 years old, lifetime of hard work. You just kick back and, you know, retire to Florida and play golf, right? But uh, no. That, that's not that's not really sold he sold all his interest in shipping and he went into the railroad industry and yeah. uh and he built it up you know he built it up brilliantly on the on the east coast and um that was he, he purchased was it the harlem line that had entrance yes. that, that had entree into new york city so that was yeah. that was that was critical that was critical. Built, yeah. built Grand Central Terminal, like you said, and it then extended westward to Chicago and other industrial yep. centers mm -hmm. um, to provide, make money uh, by providing very efficient shipping. And this, let us mm -hmm. you know, point out to the, the audience, post-Civil War, post-1865, this is the American Industrial Revolution. And this, this is the era in which the United States becomes the leading industrial center of, of, of yes. the world. Great Britain, you know, to its everlasting credit, was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. And it was the workshop of the world. I think they, they called Britain. That, well, the United States now, you know, in the late uh, 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century, becomes the workshop of the world. And, uh, Vander, you know, transportation is, is a motive power. You know, uh, like yes. in, in Atlas Shrug. Well, Vanderbilt provides the motive power, at least you know, on the on the east in the yeah. northeast, the the motive power for these great industrialists yep. to ship their goods to ship their goods to market. And yeah. we don't, you know, agriculture will not make a country rich, but it will make a country well fed. <laughs> you know, so I don't yes. want to demean, yes. you know, agriculture. We need food every day. You know, mm -hmm. you know I'm an American. Mm -hmm. I eat every day. I, these, Robert, there are these people who go on fasts for days on end. I can't, I, I you know, I, 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 I I've done them. that, I, frankly. I can't. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't, I can't do it. I'm an American. I eat every day. Um, you, you know, and food has to be shipped to market. I live, you know, I live in, still. You live for many years in New, in in New York. But, well, there's not not many farms. There are some, you know, Long Island and you know, Staten Island and New Jersey. But you know, we get food from Kansas. Uh, you know, from all different parts of the country. It needs it needs to be shipped. And the railroads were, you know, uh, yes. a, a tremendous step forward in, in in shipping goods to market. You don't have to bring it in by wagon. You know, mule. You know, mule driven mm -hmm. wagons. The railroads are much more efficient, and Vanderbilt has got to get a lot of credit. He's one of the real early giants. You know, in the in the railroad shipping industry, he was enormously yeah. efficient in, in in railroading, just like he was in steamboating. In, in the the steamboat. cost, for instance, to ship, you know, from one part of the country to another, it, he just slashed it, like hundreds of percentages from like $500 to go to like Chicago to $15 for huge gr grain, you know, um, uh, shipping grain, you know, tons and tons. Yeah. He, he found ways again to, to make these things, uh, you know, to make them profitable, but to raise the standard of living. That's, you know, that's another, yeah. Well, yeah, that's another, uh, you know, that's what he's about doing. Chicago. It, Chicago, yeah. city of the broad shoulders, Carl Sandburg, yeah. you know, called it the meat meat yeah. butchering, you know, center of the of the country, which is a horrible mm -hmm. industry, but it has to be done. If I want a steak, yeah, you know, or even a burger in yeah. New York, well, the stockyards in Chicago, they they slaughter these poor you know cattle and everything. It's horrible, but you know, that's that's the way we mm -hmm. get beef, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. the beef has to be shipped 
the beef has to be shipped to market, in this case in New York. It'd be much tougher to bring it by, you know, wagon driven by horses or oxen or mules or whatever. It, it's it's a long trip. There's no refrigeration. How do you keep the meat? How do you keep the meat fresh? But the railroads can do it in much less time. And and like you said, yeah. uh, Vanderbilt was so cost conscious. He was so efficient that he was able to bring the prices of you know of transportation of shipping way down uh, and still make a profit. And you know what did the, the great French economist or economic journalist Frederick Bastiat said Paris gets fed well well New York gets fed on a free market you know New York gets That's fed right. and the beef comes yes. in from from Chicago and the railroads yeah. you know today today the trucking industry with the interstate you know highway system in the United States but the railroads were first in, in mm -hmm. real uh uh efficient and timely transportation for you know for for shipping food so you know as as an American who wants to eat every day I'm, I'm getting hungry I'm gonna go eat a burger you know, for lunch when this is over. And I'm going to thank <laughs> Vanderbilt, you know, for being yeah, able cool. to transport, let's, let's, transport food efficiently from the Midwest to, to New York City. Before you eat, let's just talk a little bit about the stock market and his influence there and how Jay Gould and Jim Fisk, uh, so many people gained um, Vanderbilt's favor only to try to backstab him. And these two with the Erie um, stocks, they just printed thousands of stocks the way Americans print money uh, nowadays. American government prints money that were totally worthless. And Vanderbilt wanted to stave off this panic. There were, there were certainly Wall Street panics throughout history because there are some people, there are bad guys who want to manipulate markets and not create value, but just find you know find ways to manipulate and at one point Vanderbilt is standing on Wall Street this big imposing um um uh, presence and just the sight of him there calm people down it avert he averted single-handedly averted a panic and you know we talk about Morgan how important how influential JP Morgan was a, a generation later and, and you mentioned Rockefeller and Carnegie they were all young when this is why we call him the first self-made capitalist right, right. because he he right. is the one they all look up to because his view of corporation and and the unseen the the importance of wall street and finance and investing so vanderbilt even saw that he saw the value of uh stock investing and railroad stocks were the biggest thing you know they, when when he was um when he was flourishing that was that was the biggest uh industry and of course as as you just said he came in connected all of these things made efficiency reduced costs uh made things efficient and this you know if we go back to atlas shrugged the, ta the to me grand central terminal is the taggart terminal and the nat staggered nat taggart statue is this cornelius vanderbilt statue which stands right outside on 42nd Street and what is Park Avenue. If, you, if you're in the city, you could look up from the street level and see this, uh, this statue here. I'm sorry, the image is not that clear, but uh, certainly worth your while if-, if Well, yeah, you're right, York the parallels- To enjoy the statue. The parallels between, between the Taggart Terminal in New York City, the fictional terminal and, the, and Grand Central Terminal in, in real life, uh, and the parallels between Vanderbilt and Nat Taggart is certainly they're cer certainly very strong, and Ayn Rand was, was certainly aware of it. And the only thing I'm surprised about yeah. is that Vanderbilt didn't have statues of himself placed in every corner of the, you know, of the of the terminal. So everywhere you look, <laughs> ah, there's this Cornelia, ah, there's another one of you know, a, a Vanderbilt. <laughs> you know, and, and, and by the way, the terminal should be named Vanderbilt Terminal, right? I mean, come on, v Vanderbilt, come on, yes. come on, Commodore, you got. I think so. Right? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> But I think, you know, we, so we, yeah, we, I mean, we, what, oh, what a legacy, you know, if, yeah. if we think, okay, the arc of his life, Andy, George Washington's president, when he's born, U.S. Grant is the president when he dies. And in fact, Rutherford B. Hayes was already like the president elect by the time Vanderbilt dies. Morgan Rockefeller, Vanderbilt are younger, they're on the ascent, but his estimation was one out of every between 10 and 15 dollars in circulation 
That's how much Vanderbilt owned, you know, his wealth was worth if he cashed out all of his stocks like the day that he died. And nobody today can be anywhere near that amount. Like, so here's just the scope of his, his import. And again, the, uh, I, I want to give a little plug from, from my friend Richard Salzman, his book, Where Have All the Capital Has Gone? Vanderbilt was that capitalist who he, uh, Salzman calls the ad advocates. It's not that they're money makers alone. They are advocates for capitalism. And even though the term didn't really exist, he didn't specifically say it, but free markets, free enterprise, open competition, Vanderbilt's whole life, that was one of the things he was all about. And the egoistic element that goes with that and the individualist element that goes with that, all of these together comprise this giant in, in, yeah. in industry. Yeah, the, well, absolutely right. The New Jersey must be free flag summarizes. That is yes. that is individualism and, and individual rights. We get to choose, you know, you yeah. know, Fulton invented the steamboat. We, we, we salute him and give him his propers. Yes. He, he gets a patent on that. Doesn't mean, he, doesn't mean it's morally right for him, like we said before, you know, to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to have a monopoly on what we do with the steamboats after they're, after they're yeah. manufactured and sold to people. The, if somebody buys a steamboat from the Fulton Manufacturing Company and wants to use it for a ferry, that's his right. This is America. That's his right. And if people want to, mm -hmm. if people want to go on the anti-monopolist, uh, the free market ferry rather than the monopolist ferry, that's their right. And so, yeah, individualism and individual rights is is inherent in uh, in uh, pretty much all of Vanderbilt's career. Certainly, certainly the the, the start yeah. of it. So. Yeah, he is a yeah. real hero, and we didn't mention too much about his flaws. Uh, I think he—I don't—I don't know too much of the personal details. I know he disowned one of his sons. Did, did he commit his his wife to an insane asylum? I'm, you know, he did commit uh, his first sure. wife to. Yeah, yeah. Actually, okay. So yeah, let's let's level him in the sense of give, giving a, a well, broader picture. So with his wife, she, to her credit, first of all, as I said, he loved his mother. This Dutch. The Dutch female had this <laughs> gumption uh, in, back in that era. His wife raised all of his kids on her own uh, and schooled them and housed them and clothed them and all that while Vanderbilt was building his business. So we kind of left that to her. And then later in life, yeah, you know, I committed her to insane asylum, which is not was good. She really it, was she really insane? No, or, or, I, no, no I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I, and... Uh, he did remarry someone uh, younger and from the South. And, but like most of the heroes we cover, Andy, he was certainly a womanizer. It's funny. He didn't have those Sorry. other vices like smoking, drinking. Uh, I think he did smoke, but yeah, and he did play cards. So I'm undercutting what, I, what I'm just saying. I don't know how much vices they were. Oh, but right. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt wasn't a drinker. I, he's such a rough tough guy i can see well, yeah friendly with grant I, I i imagine them drinking and you know and, and everything not but big maybe, yeah no. not not big he okay. his appetites were not that for a guy so physically imposing his appetites were not that proportional i'll just put it you know okay. kind, of, kind of put it that way uh going to his son Cornel, sadly his son was a gambler and would gamble away things left and right i think horace greeley would but he would sell his wife's jewelry and vanderbilt even told the 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 fiance he said if you marry my son you better hide all your jewelry because he will steal it and sell it and and that's oh what God. ended up happening oh so it's God. a hard relationship there especially when the one's named after you you know the the, yeah. the son is named after yeah. you. Uh, by the way, three sons, George, William, and Cornelius, were his heroes. William Henry Harrison was the president. George Washington was president. And Cornelius Vanderbilt was another hero of Vanderbilt. <laughs> so sure. with the son, sure. I, I, you know, and he was really tough on his oldest son, William, who he left was the primary heir and would belittle him in front of people. And that's one reason J J John Davidson Rockefeller um, didn't respect the son. He respected Cornelius, but he didn't respect William. And William went on to, you know, certainly build the, the current Grand Central, but that's where the ostentation comes out. When the ancestors have all this wealth, then they start to, to 
spend it lavishly. Again, something that Cornelius would never have right. done. So mixed bag, personally, de definitely. Yeah, yeah I just one, in that sense. Yeah, uh, no, I well, just one last comment I want to make. You know, back then there was no psychotherapy, you know, or anything. So if if yeah. your wife really mm -hmm. is insane, she has to be committed, or somebody dear to you. That's very sad. But if she's not insane and he has a committed. That's really, I mean, that's, pre that's pretty, that that's is, pretty you're right. bad. I mean, I mean why yeah. not just divorce? Why didn't he just, was he so religious or the, was the, the culture uh, so Moravian. That, In fact, I hopped over the fence by, say, in Staten Island. That's right. He, he's Moravian buried Church, in Staten right. Island, in Moravian Church. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't get, you have to climb the fence, which I've done. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of get closer right. to the uh, to to the to the cemetery uh, there, and yeah, so although he wasn't like devout in his religious beliefs, there were there was a lot of um, I'll just say that part of him clearly was was not his, his strongest point, and and yeah, certainly treatment of his wife, he should have done better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's horrible if she's yeah. sane and he has a has a committed to an insane yeah. asylum because he wants to be rid of her. That's that's really low. I mean, but okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So we so we get two thumbs down for that commodore. Two thumbs uh, down on we're, that. We're, we're gonna take down some of your statues because of that. You know, not all of them, but <laughs> but no, that's 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 really bad. But people are often mixed, you know, and uh, they could they could they they could be mixtures of really good and and really bad uh so uh, yeah this is the power okay. this shows the power of an integrating philosophy andy right where where you know moral integrity and and acting on you know you make a choice to be with someone and you should be faithful i mean it's just that simple the, the, there's no there's no gray area there and like many other heroes, I mean, he wasn't the first one to do this. As much as of, of a flaw that we admit it to be, it's just, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not who he was, but that's not what yeah, he, it's a, you it's know, unconscionable. look at the grand scheme of uh, things. Yeah. yeah, he was a great man, but this is unconscionable. Um, and given how individualistic he was, if the Moravian church did not countenance divorce, uh, you know, he could, he could still, he said, look, I'm going to, you know, you, you don't have to like it. And maybe you'll excommunicate me yeah. if the Moravia church does that. Uh, but mm -hmm. the relationship's intolerable. And uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divorce her. She won't be penniless. I'll make sure, you know, she has money because she's been my wife and the mother of my children, uh, of our children for all these years. I'll make sure she has mm -hmm. a very generous life. But I can't live with her anymore. It's intolerable. You know, that's what a real individualistic guy would do. Commit her to a same stuff. I agree. Oh, yeah, that's, that's horrible. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So uh, no, yeah. no dispute there, Andy. Uh, absolutely not. But again, you know, one of the things, if, if we just go back to Ayn Rand, uh, because she mentions Vanderbilt over and over in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideals, she talks about yeah. how he, you know, just his name is brandished. And, uh, and she calls our era or, you know, late, late 20th century, the, end, the age of envy. And the envy of Vanderbilt was palpable from the New York Times to Mark Twain, who would trash him. So the intellectuals just did not like that this, quote, uncultured man amassed so much wealth without them knowing the source of the wealth. Again, if we go back to Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand's ideas, here's where Vanderbilt is like the embodiment of the productive, innovative mindset who left, if left free, will revolutionize you know transportation which is certainly what he did right right that's the first word and the last word about vanderbilt is that he was enormously productive uh -huh. in the transportation industry yeah. and that's why and that's yeah. why we, and both steamboats and railroads that's why we honor him that's right and, yes. and so exactly. i think i think we have done justice to the commodore um I and, think so. And so I think we, 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 could, we could salute you, Commodore Vanderbilt. And Robert, I, I think we have come to the end of another Hero Show episode. So, you know, I want to wish yes. you a heroic day. And every, if you and me, me and everybody out there in Hero Land, let us strive to lead more heroic lives. And we'll be back next week Absolutely. with another episode of the Hero Show. Have a great day, everybody. Signing off. Take care, Andy.